wonderful. Well, I am here to talk about now. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Right there. Uh, so, now. <laughs> so, um, I am an artist, right? And uh, I didn't expect to be an artist, but it works because it is one of the only places where the way that this mind works makes sense. Um, one of the funny things is, as a teenager, which is where many of us who write kind of find our desire for poetry, it is a perfect outlet for teen angst, uh, especially for when you're crushing on someone and they don't recognize you or know you. And so I had a friend, and of course, I used to always be like, hook me up. Oh girl, cute, do to introduce me. <laughs> and she would be like, no, you think too much. You're way too mental <laughs> for my friends. And I was like, I feel like there's supposed to be a compliment in there somewhere. But this really isn't helpful right now. And so when you think and get lost in your own mind the way that I do, um, you, you hope that you can find a place where it all makes sense. Um, and I found that in art. And so, in that, what that provides me is the opportunity to engage with a number of people. One of, my, one of my most joyous and wonderful things is to do workshops. Now, there's an activity that I do when I'm doing workshops that I love to do, and it is called the I Am Activity, right? Now, this activity um, involves a series of questions, five questions that I ask, and I tell the participants to only write the answers down to the questions. Now, there's only a few rules to this activity. One is that the answers have to be statements, can't be a list. Two, they can't answer any question the same way more than once. Okay? They can't answer any question the same way more than once. And three, they can interpret the questions however they choose. Right? So what I want you to do is I'm going to tell you what the questions are, and I want you to just take a moment to think about what your answers to these questions might possibly be. Okay? Here's the question. Here's the question. The first question is, what are two people, two people who have influenced you and made you into the person that you are? Two people. Second question is what are two places that have had a great influence on who you are? Two places. Third question, third question is what are two things that matter to you? What are two things that matter to you? Fourth question is, what are three things that you stand for but are believed in? What are three things that you stand for or believe in? And then the last question which makes this activity is that it closes with three I am statements. And I simply ask the question, who are you? What are those characteristics that people always talk about who do you see yourself as? Who are you? You can interpret these questions however you choose to. Those are the five questions that I ask in this activity. All right. You know, just so you can give an example, here's mine. <clears throat> I am Vaughn, Doris, and Bethel's blessing. Product of below the Mason Dixon line in the south side of the city, shaped by black exceptionalism. Influenced by working class idealism and raised by a black woman's resolve. I believe in great speeches, beat drops, and I stand for my dates arrival. Feel like we are the answer we have always need. Hold true to the fact that we can figure out how to maneuver in any way that we can imagine. See, I, I am the well-mannered example who broke his way dangerous. Fashionable laborer determined to show you how to work these hats better. I am part moonshine and pearl handle 38. <laughs> A gallon jug and kerosene damn you to light the match. See, I'm beautiful enough to rebel and smart enough to convince you to accept it. Uh, <laughs> 
So I call this activity a declaration of self. And what I tell them is that in this activity, one of the things that it does is it says that you get to introduce yourself to me in your own words, in your own verse, in, on, in your own voice, and on your own terms. Right? The other thing about this is I say that when this is over, I know who you truly are. So it doesn't matter what anyone else says, what the world says, or however, whatever situation I see you in, I know because you told me exactly who you are. Now, the other part about this, because you might be wondering, what does this have to do with the concept of now? So here's the other thing about it. The other thing about this is that with this activity, it says, I am this. But I told them that it is a part of a continuum, that it can change and shape over time. The people who influence you may shift as you grow to know more people. The places that, may, that influence you may change as you experience more places, the things may change as you interact with more things. What you stand for and believe in may shift, change, or deepen based on your experiences and the things that you're able to kind of come in contact with. And who you are is an ever-evolving process. But you get to say what it is, whatever you say it, and when you say it, it is that. And so on this continuum, what it says to me is that in this moment, in this now I am, but because I am, I will be. And that is the power in that activity. And that's why this is important to me in talking about now. Because what it does is it talks about the fact that I am now, but I will also be. Now, this kid right here, <laughs> you should have known there was going to be a cute kid picture in this face. Come on now. Come on now. <clears throat> this kid had no idea about anything that I'm doing right now. He did not imagine this, he did not dream of this, he did not envision this. This kid right here was special. Oh my goodness, this kid right here was a bundle of energy, mischief, curiosity, and rambunctiousness. He had a short attention span and was all over the place. I say he got lucky because he was tested instead of giving medication and moved into advanced classes around here, AG, AG classes, you know, G, Mac, and gifted and talented. <laughs> Otherwise, he could have been, he could have been given a whole other solution for being a kid who always finished his work fast and talked to everyone around him. And, but this kid, this kid liked to read Agatha Christie. It's so Arthur Conan Doyle and L. Ron Hubbard. <laughs> this should Earth not diabetics. <laughs> Don't do that. I was not that strange of a kid. Not 10 years old, down in Scientology. Don't do that. <laughs> this kid had an overactive of imagination. Um, and beautifully enough, my, my, my mother and my family, um, my mother's the oldest of her siblings, and she had me when she was 16. They did not understand me enough to let me be, which means they did not stop me from imagining me. They were like, he's occupied. We don't know what he's doing over there. This kid made his own toys. This kid made up games and played them by himself. Like, this kid got lost in his head. He didn't know what that was going to mean for the future. <laughs> All right? They never expected that it would turn out like it did. But what happened is that he found a community. The community is so important, y'all. Um, here's what happened in that community. He was given an opportunity. There were folks who saw his potential, saw his talent, saw his passion, saw his a desire to learn more and said, let's feed that. Let's give him things to do. Let's offer him things. And I was, you know, I had my Jim Carrey moment where I just said yes to things. I figured it out along the way, but I said yes. I took the opportunity and jumped in. And there's a thing that I believe. I believe that you try to leave every experience with both uh, a memory and a memento. Right? You want to leave with an eye, something that something that reminds you of the experience, but also something that you took away from it and gained. Right? Um, when I was younger, it was how I maneuvered through the world, trying to make my way. Um, I would work a job when I got done with what I was doing, because uh, same thing, same thing as adults and kids. I got done before everybody else. I asked, "What else can I do?" And then next thing you know, I'm applying for another job to say I know how to do the things that really wasn't in my job description, but y'all let me figure out how to do. And then I got another job with more money. That's how. I <laughs> right? Because I love every experience. I'm going to leave with it. I'm going to leave with a memory and a momentum. Here's the thing about that. What I learned was 
is that if I'm present, then everything that's going on in that moment and everything that is shaping me right then is preparing me for what's next. And I don't have to worry about what's next because my now will help make sure that I'm equipped for my next. And if my next shift is because my now shifted it, and whatever it shifted it to is going to be okay. Right? I am, so I will be. Right? Now, one of the things about that is this clock that we, oh my God, we get so caught up in this clock. Right? It's not the hours in the day. You know, it's only so much time. You can't waste any time. There's this ticking clock that we love to fall in love with, and it gives us a scarcity mindset, y'all. Right? We're always worrying about it running out. And so we're always thinking ahead to try to be concerned about when the time is gone. We never leave ourselves enough time to enjoy the time while we have it. If we know it's going to go away, then why not spend our energy embracing it while we have it? So here's the thing. We understand time, but the burden of inevitability will rob you of the chance to really, really dig into the possible. The burden, <laughs> the burden of the inevitable will rob you of the opportunity to really, really dig into and enjoy the possible. Because what's possible is in the now, not in the next. Right? That's an illusion. That's an excuse. It robs us of us having to be present because present is joyous, it's beautiful, it's amazing. There's so much there, so much that we take for granted that we don't give enough time to. But it also comes with responsibility, and it also comes with the choice to be accountable. And when you know better, you got to do better. If we can think about it and push it off, it means that we don't have to do that. But we keep pushing it off, and it becomes distant and away from us. So <clears throat> there's this activity that I also do with my students, um, and it is called it's called 60 minutes to live. So here's the activity. I said that you wake up, you look over to the pillow next to you, and you see that there's a sticky note on the pillow. Now, already that seems strange because you're wondering why is there a sticky note on my pillow? If there's supposed to be somebody lying next to you, it's even stranger. <laughs> the sticky note says, check your voicemail. You check your voicemail, and there's an ominous voice on the voicemail that says, you have 60 minutes to live. When this voicemail stops, you hear a beeping coming from inside of you. When the beeping speeds up, you're running out of time, and it stops, so do you. The only way to stop this is if you can find the meaning of life. <laughs> Sit with that for a moment. <laughs> and you can imagine that exhale, that collective exhale, is exactly what happens when I say, all right now, go. Tell me what happens next. And I'll let the folks go, write, talk, discuss. It is one of the most beautiful things I have ever seen. All of this reconciling, doesn't matter what age, all this reconciling with broken relationships with whoever matters to you, and religion, and faith, and beauty, and looking at the world. Some people rob banks and do all kinds of <laughs> things. You know? <laughs> but one of the things is 98% of the people who participate in this activity ultimately come to terms with the fact that it will all end soon. And, after, and I've had moments where folks get all crying at the moment we get done with this, and I have to be the workshop facilitator who goes, so, here's the thing, beautiful, oh my God, y'all have moved me to tears, but here's the thing about this. I gave you these parameters and then said, tell me what happens next. I handed it over to you, and all y'all did was live in the literal and prepare for the unknown. Nobody actually took control. Not one. 90% of the people never actually take control. They don't change the circumstances. They don't do anything. It could have been anything. The little brother could have jumped out the closet like, I got you. You know, there's no, there's, no, there's no limit to what could happen. But it all starts with believing that you have the power to change the narrative. That's what I mean about the now. The now says, I have power over this moment. And if I have power over this moment, then I have a hand in shaping my tomorrow. Right? Here's the thing. We work for these organizations that we talk about vision and mission, right? Our vision is what we want to achieve and what it looks like when we get there. Our mission is the steps that we're going to take as a part of our purpose. 
We always talk about being mission aligned, right? Being mission aligned is about the now. Right? It is about the now. If you're in the now and you are mission aligned and you are doing the work that will take you in the direction that you want to go. Right? And if you do that well enough, you will achieve that vision. If it shows you new things, then you change your vision to continue in your mission. I am, so I will be. Right? So, this is a beautiful thing. This is St. Kofferberg. One of the things that like, blew me away about the idea of St. Kofferberg is that um, it is this idea that, that you can reach back to the past and grab the things that they get left behind. But it is about a bird standing and moving forward. What it does is it reinforces this idea of this continuum, that the things in your past are important for shaping your future. Don't forget your past. Don't lose track of your past. You don't want to repeat it. And one of the beautiful things about the same culture that stuck out to me, the river, I think a little different, is about how it reinforces the now. See, here's the thing. Your past is a foundational understanding. Your future is an idea, is a theory. Now is your practical application. It is built on your past. It is about understanding what will be your future. Your now is where everything that matters rests. If you're in it and you embrace it, and you celebrate it, and you allow yourself it, and you tell yourself that you deserve it, then it will continue to define your future. And that was the thing that was powerful for me. So in thinking about all this, um, there's three days before the sun cursed God, a lightning bug made love to a hurricane beneath a rose bush. They say the devil pulled a hole in the star nine months later that bug gave birth to a tempest. But that anomaly crowned king of ongoing despair, Mother Nature wet nursed it prophecy in a celebration. Thunder snuck into a waterfall and stole the courage out of a larynx hidden by ruby face charitable. And I haven't cried over my own pain since. See, there's an anecdote for every falter, a million ways to pretend you're not broken, a metaphor for every aberration. It's an eloquent show, like your heart hanging for your bow battery of a voice box, tongue branch, hollow inside, your courage, understanding, and purpose, black and blue picnic for the white girls of your insecurities to laugh and gawk at, like, you thought she was walking here. I have been begging to fall apart for some time now. The devil's in the duct tape, damn strong that it is. I have hated purpose for the grain that it wants to do when I want my inks to be so black and white for sticking to the point that there is always more work to do. Heaven realized I learned the secret is super good. Nail polish removal at midnight had me in the arms of indulgence to scratch me back free from this madness of a burden, so I was given adhesive instead of wings and a pen instead of a halo. See, this, this is the riddle of a poet trying to make his way, understanding that he's searching for a gypsy who can teach me transition, who can show me the answer in the midst of two onyx stones in pearl, and a redwood treasure chest full of opportunity. This is the chapter and verse of a man's staff to lead, a Moses running errands for a group of people who would never understand the seeds he had to split to get here. Trying to make his way through the wilderness, to escape the golden they have made my image without any understanding of how to make promise candy. I tried to give this world the gift of a gracious understanding, expecting the reward of reciprocity, and all I've gotten is a reputation for being a glorious tourist attraction. He said that in these poems you will find opponents, artifacts, and brokenness. I say inside of this you're going to find revelations, hidden meanings, and clues. There are cries for help and affirmations, I'm going to be okay. There are mirrors and flamethrowers. There are coloring books and unfinished suicide notes. There are dead John letters to the pain I've known too long and birthday cards for the pain I'll know too soon. There are promises unkept, endings unwritten, and doors dead bolted shut. But y'all, there is also joy. There is joy there, y'all. There is joy. There is a simple but complex amalgamation of the beautiful that God made me. There's a recognition that every night is an affirmation, that every morning is an opportunity, that every day still breathing is a testimony, it is a reverie of resilience that we are all deserving of. And see, that is the story I'm committed to telling. See, the thing about this is, is that we should never overlook the now. Because our joy, our happiness, our understandings, our discoveries, 
are in the now. I am process oriented because I know that dreams are not motivation, they're destination. And if we order our steps toward them, that either we will achieve those dreams or we will discover a new one. But now is the moment where everything happens, right? Trust ourselves, our past is there. And we are more than capable of achieving our future. And if we aren't capable of achieving our future yet, if we rest in the now, we will equip ourselves to be capable of whatever comes next. I am, so I will be. And that is what I want you to take away from the day. Remind yourself, I am, so I will be. What I will be then will be what I am. Yesterday is another thing. This is now. Tomorrow will soon be my now. So if I rest in my now, I will prepare myself for my next now. I am, so I will be. Thank y'all. Thank y'all so much.
PTSD of the past and anxiety of the future. Mm -hmm. And really be just in the present and find my peace. That's the only place that you can really find your peace. And at 32, I had like my first moment of feeling like an innocent child and then just, just on a Saturday afternoon and just letting the sun shine in and everyone's eating breakfast and oh my God, like, don't think about anything, but like, this is a cool moment. We're just chilling. Like, this is how do the kids feel right now? They don't have the stresses of thinking about all these things. They're really just enjoying their Saturday morning. And I felt it for the first time because someone was talking back. And I had to practice. This is a practice. You can't just think like that and then keep going. Like, you have to practice this. So I appreciate it. And I appreciate it as you said it because it reminds me, but it also is fresh. Like, it's so fresh how you presented it. So thank you. That was it. Thank you. No, that's so real. Yeah, yes, yes. I feel like I was about to clap for y'all. But it's very real. So it's also my part of my survival. Um, because I have an overactive mind. I can get lost. And I can get lost. I can turn positive things into anxiety because of how much I pick it apart. I can also get stuck in a dark place and not be able to get out. Me being present is difficult. There's so many people in my life who just don't get it or don't understand it. It's confusing to them. They like, and then there are other people who don't get it, but they just choose to accept it because they're used to it by now. Uh, but that is how I operate. I am present here because I can pick. If I'm going to pick something apart, I'm going to pick the narrow part and find all the things I can take from it. That's way more exciting thing about learning about tomorrow. I'm not letting go before. And peace of mind is, is I remind myself over and over again what matters most. So there are moments where I seem stoic. I'm not stoic. I'm completely paying attention, right? But I'm not about to be bothered. Yeah. And there are moments where I choose to be oblivious. I have a complete understanding of what is going on, but I'm not engaging, right? Because this is my now, and I am not getting backed up in your whatever, yesterday, tomorrow, what have you. Um, and I always say, well, the beautiful thing about it is, is that if you are consistent, everyone else will adjust to you. Because they'll get used to that, that it is what it is, and that's not changing. In fact, right? I am, so I, so I will be. So you can try tomorrow, it's going to be the same thing. Every day in your life, this is how it's going to be. So you can change, I ain't. Um, and that makes it work for me. I got a question here. Uh, yeah, thank you for doing this. The last time I heard you was a few years ago when you spoke about Night Wonder, and that was a very impactful thing. And I've been following you ever since, so I. Good to hear it, like, you know, continue for you and your evolution. But with that, when you're talking about defining your I am, it's a clear thing that when you speak, and I appreciate what you're saying, it, for the sake of what you're saying, it has to make sense. Like, you define your I am and then you move on. So, what about the folks that after you speak come to you and say, I'm not in trouble defining what my I am is? Those questions that you're asking, I don't have the clearly defined answer because maybe I'm evolving. Person, where does that intersect with the evolution of yourself defining that I am? And if somebody is mixed up at that time, what what words do you have for you from your experience of helping them deal with that? Great question. Um, part of it is recognizing that it is a, that it is an uncomfortable journey. Um, so that's the first thing. And, it, and it's so funny because we always talk about. Um, Disruption and discomfort being a, being, being a reminder that you're, like, you're making the right decision and moving in the right way. Um, but we seem to be able to embrace that conversation when we're talking about someone else or when things are further from who from us personally. Um, but it still holds true. So the first thing is that it's an uncomfortable thing. And the reason why I say that is that um, is because it is a journey. So the questions are there. Uh, so. It's like, it's like a math teacher who said, you got the answer, but where's the work? So it's still wrong. And we, you know, we all got frustrated. Like, I don't want to write out all the things. I already figured out the answer. You know, the answer is the answer. Like, that's the, that's, and that's, for me, part of this is, is, is separating myself from the answer. Um, in recognizing that the, that the work and the process towards the answer is where the value is. So, and that's the uncomfortable part, because if you don't have an answer to any one of those questions, um, you, have, you can worry about not, have, not having an answer, or you can embrace that not having an answer means that there's room for you to enjoy.
joy of journey towards figuring out what the answer would be. I choose that because that's where all the fun, exploration, that's where the, the beautiful discomfort all comes in. That's where my curiosity gets fed. It gives me more room and more breath to be and exist in the world to say that not having an answer means there's room for me to figure it out. It also says that I get to decide where is the possible solution or answer or possible next thing. Do I need to have more conversations with the people around me? Are there things that I've said that I have not, have not made time, experience that I haven't made time for? Now I have a reason to, because there's a purpose to why I'm making time for them. Where if I don't have a purpose, then I do what we all do, and say I'll get to it later when I have more money. I don't have three, four days left to go anywhere. Like we do these things where we rob ourselves of things. So that's my answer, and, and that's my response is like, don't worry about, worry, worry about the questions, don't worry about the answers. Um, you'll either have them, but also the thing I always say is the answer that you have now may not be the answer that you have a month later. So you are really the answer. Have the questions. And having the questions mean that when you are experiencing life, you will have a gauge that says, this is useful to answer one of these questions, but I gotta have the questions. Um, and so that's the thing. That's, that would be my response. And that's what happened for me. I didn't start figuring things out until I had questions to answer. Right? I had a bunch of people around me trying to give me answers. I did what most young folks, I did what most folks do. They didn't fit, they didn't make sense, and I rebelled at all. Luckily enough, I didn't rebel so much that it like completely disrupted my life. I tried a couple of times. And I had some self-destructive tendencies. When, when I met people who gave me questions, was when I figured out how to navigate my life. Because you give me the questions and let me figure out how to get to the answers, then I'm equipping myself for whatever is next. And so ever since then, what I look for, and that's the, the moment that like the memory or the momentum, I, I walk into a situation with questions. Um, and I let the experience help me find the answer. And that's difficult. We really just want to know what the answer is. <laughs> but I value the questions more. We have a couple more. We have a little chair up here. Okay, we got a microphone over here. And then you're. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Go for it. Hi, I just, uh, I'm a visual artist, and I was curious about maybe your, your journey into um, becoming an older artist. Um, I think it's, um, when you're in the arts, the new shiny artists, they're exciting, they've got um, a, a fresh sort of um, vision of life and creativity sometimes. Um, and as I, I'm moving into middle age, I'm, that's my journey, and, and the now for me is embracing that that is a good thing, um, but I'm still figuring it out. And so I'm just curious how you approach that, not that you're middle age, in the imagination. Mm -hmm. um, but just, I, I'd be curious to, to hear about your, your journey in this season of life. Yeah, so the view, so that's a great question as well. And one of the things is, um, and I'm also a pop culture, I'm also a pop culture person, and I teach hip hop and things like that. And this, this helps me give me a, give me a, a way to prepare this. Um, so many, we, <laughs> uh, the new shiny thing happens, and there's a lot of things that are focused to emergence. Um, but the react, so th there's a thing about the way that things are working, are presented to us, and the way things really are. And we can, and, and in our society, how things are presented to us um, is what drives society in a lot of ways, but it's because it drives our decision making, and eventually there are things attached to it, particularly the infant involvement. But the reality of things is, is that for all those of us who are older and creating, there are folks on the same journey. And when you think about all the things that we've experienced that influence our art, there are people who've gone through those same things. And so what it reminds, what I'm reminded by is whenever I'm out and I'm authentically sharing my art, there's a number of conversations that I end up having from people who find themselves in the art. Which reminds me that I am creating, I'm consistently creating for a group of people who exist. Um, and will be until I'm no longer here. And then your art gets a whole new life because people discover it. And it's usually younger folks who discover where they find where they're going in it and holding and lifting it up, and then it gets a whole new journey. But while we're on the journey, um, we're creating for people who are going on the journey with us. 
And honestly, if you look at the numbers, there's a humongous number of those folks waiting in the city. And also, much like all of us in this room, we're continuing to find ourselves. So every question you're answering in your art that you're answering for yourself, someone else is going is trying to figure out the answer to the same question. And, you, and, and it might be in your art. Or either the inspiration to continue to keep seeking an answer is in your art. And so that's that's how I, that's how it's been. Um, the other thing is so and, and you know, doing the workshops means that I get to be in front of young people so that when I share my art, that's always anxiety about oh young people, you know, just standing up here. You know, but there's also a thing about they may not get all of it, but they get that there is something there, right? And that makes them curious. Because oftentimes they're way more curious than we are, and our curiosity is robbed of us as we move into adulthood. So they see a thing, and they want to know what's the thing in that that I see. Tell me that, because I know it's going to mean something later. And it's just up to us to be present enough in our art to be able to then still tell, see, hear that question and answer it, but also recognize that that if, if it's there, there's someone else like me who needs that. And so the art is 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 now, it's tomorrow, and it's behind us. So you always are a shiny new thing. <laughs>
also, also one of the things about this is that when you, if you do what I'm saying, and you leave with a memory and a memento, you're also giving yourself more tools, which means there's, your, your brain says, more things I can do. What I tell myself is don't do more things, right? Keep embracing the things that I do, and the opportunity to use the things that I'm learning will, will bring themselves. So each one of the things will provide you an opportunity to feed these other things you can do. Or eventually, what you'll do is you'll manifest opportunities to use multiple things at once. Um, so I just carry it off. I show up wholly and authentically, and I hope wait for And I see in this, I have this opportunity. How many of these things have? Three? Cool. One? Cool. Five? Great. <laughs> right? Because there's 10 here. There's 10 here. I haven't gotten anywhere where they're going to use all 10, but I'm going to keep growing until one day. I'm going to be able to use all 10. Oh, I've learned enough that eventually I'll create the space for all 10 years. <laughs>